Good morning, poultry keepers. You know, I've got a question for you. Have you been thinking about maybe adding quail to your poultry flock? I know some of you have because I've seen you posting, but they are an inexpensive bird to raise and they produce a great source of protein at an amazingly fast rate. I, it, it blows my mind sometimes. And coming up in this show, Rebecca Lynch is going to be sharing with us about Coternix quail. And Rebecca is from Thieving Otter Farm up in Tennessee. So right after this, we'll start talking with Rebecca. How about we start with you telling us a little bit how you got into quail, uh, and we'll just go from there talking about them. Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Rip. Um, I got into quail completely by accident. Uh, I had a friend who had uh, two two sizes of quail. She had jumbo and standard, and she decided she just wanted to focus on on jumbo and asked if I wanted her standards. And I had honestly never considered quail, never thought about quail, uh, didn't even know how to pronounce Coternix. <laughs> so <laughs> she, uh, she said, look, I'll give you the birds, just pay $40 for the cage. And I thought, well, if I don't like them, I guess we can eat them. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's a deal. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I got some and they were all the, the standard brown color. Um, and I uh, Shortly after I got them, I realized that these are really cool birds and, and that I, I really liked them. And then I discovered that there were different colors and different patterns and different sizes. And uh, I fell down a rabbit hole and I have been obsessed ever <laughs> since. <laughs> you know, that's what amazes me. I had them years ago when I was younger and I loved the birds, but you had two choices. Well, really, you had a little bit more than that. But color wise, you could have either the wild color or you could have white and right. you could get them in standard size or jumbo. And that was pretty much it. And then looking at some of the photos that we're going to be sharing with the folks today, it has blown my mind that we now have Bantam Coternix quail and um, standards and jumbos and then a whole raft of colors. So just yes. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, you know, since those original quail were in circulation, um, there have been some uh, mutations that have occurred and that have allowed us to have all different patterns and colors. So, uh, and, and most of those patterns and colors are compatible with each other. So there, there's so many different combinations to make, you know, something new and beautiful. Um, so this picture here, I borrowed from uh, Michael Rose at Southwest Game Birds. Um, and this shows the, the three different size of uh, Coternix quail that are available right now. Um, uh, well, I should say three different sizes that uh, could be available, but Bantam is not really in circulation. So um, you see a lot of jumbo. Jumbo is most popular. Uh, people want jumbos because obviously they're, they're bigger um, if you're raising them for meat, uh, that, you know, that would be a better sized bird. Um, and then there's quite a few standards in circulation as well. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a little video here, um, to, to show, uh, kind of some of the, the variations, uh, just, just a few of, of what is available out there. Those were amazing. I, and I got to be honest with you, and, and I don't think it was in this slide presentation, but you had sort of what I thought was a buff color 
and mm-hmm. and and I asked you about it, and you said it was a blue fawn, which is the name of a color pattern in call ducks. And that bird was beautiful. I, you know, I I never thought I'd say that about a Caternix quail being beautiful, but it was just absolutely stunning. Thank you. Yeah, I take a lot of pride in my birds, um, and and that's another reason why I really got into quail. Um, I, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail in a little bit, but but I had gotten into chicken breeding and it takes so long for a chicken to mature. Uh, So, you know, it it can take a couple of years before you get a new generation, but quail mature so quickly. um, I can, I can get several generations in one year. Uh, So it was fun for me to work with my breeding programs and, and practice those uh, with these birds. How long does it take for quail to mature? I I think I know, but I'm not going to trust my brain this morning. Yeah, it's amazing. So an egg hatches in 17 to 18 days. The bird will be laying, uh, after hatching, will be laying in six to eight weeks. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, my mind is boggled by how fast and how many generations Uh-oh. you can turn these things over. It's, I know, a chicken isn't even fully feathered out in six weeks, and these amen. birds are, I mean, are feathered true. and laying. It's amazing. My, <laughs> he said they're not fully feathered. My Rhode Island red males weren't fully feathered for about 10 months. And (laughs) by then you got a whole couple of three generations of quail on the ground. Absolutely. A lot of people ask why quail, you know, Mm -hmm. what, why, why would I want to, you know, bring these birds onto my farm? Um, You know, they're great little birds. Uh, They can be kept in a small area. So, you know, if you're thinking about getting into, into quail, um, but don't have a lot of room, um, you know, th- this is, this is a great bird. Uh, you know, they're great for urban homesteads. There's a lot of people that, uh, you know, would like to have chickens, but they can't have them because they live in the city and the neighbors will get mad or whatever. But, uh, you know, th- they don't take up much space. They don't make much noise. Uh, they don't eat a whole lot of feed. Um, <laughs> if you garden, they provide compost material. Um, and, uh, you know, the eggs are fantastic. You know, they're a lot smaller than a chicken egg. You need maybe, you know, three of them to to equal a chicken egg. Um, But I actually like the taste better than a chicken egg. It's it's, it's real rich. Um, We, you know, we'll take the time to to make a full breakfast out of quail eggs. um, And they make little scissors to make it easier to to break the shells. (laughs) Um, Yeah, there's a good picture of them there Um, compared to the chicken eggs. Uh, and the, the birds themselves are really tasty. Um, they're, they're easy to process. I can process a quail in about two minutes. Um, wow. yeah. And, uh, wrap them with bacon, stuff them with cream cheese and pop them in the oven or a smoker. And, and they're amazing. So you need to eat a couple of them or maybe three if you're raising standards like I do. Um, but they're, they're good. And uh, since they do reproduce so fast, you know, you can you can cull your males and, and eat those and save the females for egg production and have a pretty good supply of food handy on a regular basis. Well, I tell you what, I've got a, a recipe uh, for quail and peach brandy sauce. Ooh, that, that was I shouldn't say was it is really good. Uh, I used it frequently when I was out quail hunting, but you talked about space. How much space does it take, let's say, for a jumbo quail? How big you know, it, it varies. Um, and uh, kind of the rule of thumb is uh, anywhere from uh, three birds per square foot uh, to a bird per square foot. Um, and the reason why it varies is it depends on, um, you know, like you said, the size of the bird. You asked about jumbo. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, um, where you, where you get your birds from, if the breeder has bred, uh, for temperament and has cold aggressive birds, um, then you can keep more birds in a smaller area. Uh, but these birds are known for, for being kind of mean to each other. Um, but I guess anybody in poultry keepers 360 is used to, uh, chickens kind of being jerks too. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I know that when I was raising them, they, some of them could get a little feisty. Yes, but you can breed for that. You can breed for that. Uh, quail are known for scalping each other. 
Uh, they'll go for mm -hmm. the back of the head and, and they can do a lot of damage. But the great thing about quail is they heal extremely fast. So if you take that scalp bird and you set it by itself, you don't even really have to doctor it or anything. Just set it by itself, allow it to heal. Um, you, as soon as those feathers grow back in, in about a week or 10 days, you can put it right back in and, and everything will be fine. Um, my goal is to look for the bird with blood on its beak. Uh, who, who did the scalping and remove that bird from the breeding program? And within a couple of generations, you can, you can just about eliminate that aggression. You had a picture of the eggs up there, um, the chicken eggs in comparison to quail eggs. And we even have quail now that lay a different colored egg is my understanding. Yes. Yeah. So there's the folks who are, are into different colors in the egg baskets. Quail can meet that bill very well. Tell us about that. Absolutely. Those. Yeah, there's a, a gene that has, uh, it was a, a mutation that popped up that allowed quail to lay blue eggs. Mm. Uh, so um, if, if you have that, uh, that gene in your cubby, uh, you can get some beautiful blue eggs. Uh, some are solid blue, some are blue with black speckles. Um, and then if you, you know, start combining those genes with the regular quail gene, you can see the array of colors that you can get there. So yeah, the, the eggs themselves, even the regular quail eggs are really pretty with their, yeah. their spots and speckles. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think I had a picture in there as well of uh, the, the quail growth. I had a, a picture of three quail. Um, so that first chick in the, in the front there is a, a new hatch chick. The one behind it is 10 days old. And oh, my God. And the one in the, in the background is 21 days. So you can wow. see, yeah, that, that middle chick is, at 10 days old is, is really only lacking, lacking head feathers. Um, so it, it is absolutely amazing how fast those grow. As a general rule, how flighty are quail? Are they, are they nervous birds? Or? Um, the jumbos, and again, like you said, how, the, how they're you know, bred and raised and, and selected for plays a big role. But the jumbos tend to be less flighty. Uh, the smaller you get, the more flighty they are. So I, I have not uh, had experience with the Bantams myself, but in speaking to a Bantam breeder, they're extremely flighty. You might as well have a wild sparrow in your hand. Mm. Um, I raise the standards. Um, and when you first pick them up, they're, they're flapping around trying to get away, um, but they settle down fairly quickly and I can... You know, you, you saw in the video, those pictures of quail. I just set them on, on a retaining wall and took those pictures and they just stood there and looked around. So um, that's not to say that I haven't had a quail fly away and haven't had to chase it. <laughs> so, <laughs> we won't talk about that. We'll yeah, talk. but the nice thing about it, when they do fly, they tend to fly up and then fly a few feet and land. Um, they they <laughs> flush like, you know, like what I hear Bob White does. Um, so they fly straight up and then they land and then they, they kind of hide and hunker down. And if you're lucky, you can catch them at that point. Otherwise it, it's going to be like in the peanuts where, where they kept, you know, hitting the hat and it would go forward every time they went to go grab it. <laughs> so, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about their cage setup, but that is something that you have to keep in mind because they do fly straight up and they fly up very fast. Um, and they're known for, you know, they're, they're a really, really hardy bird and they don't have a lot of diseases and stuff, but they will die from, you know, flying up quickly and whacking their heads on mm -hmm. uh, in a cage that is of improper size. I, so, I, I have experienced that. In this. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Um, I think I have a, a video of uh, some of my, my quail chicks. I'll, I'll show you um, what they look like as a new hatch chick. They come out of the shell. It's like popcorn. They pop out of mm -hmm. the shell and they hit the ground running. And uh, this video that I have here is of them still in the hatch. And this is not sped up. So you can tell that they're they're a very active and vigorous chick. They, they all hatch at about the same time, right. um, and it is like popcorn. You'll have a couple mm -hmm. that, that hatch a little early, and then they all explode, and then there's a couple that hatch a little late. But 
it, it's amazing. Once they get to hatching, they, they they mean business. <laughs> Doesn't take them long. That's for sure. It, yeah. it, it, they're, they're very different from poultry in that, or chickens mm -hmm. in that respect. But tell us a little bit, if you would, about raising quail and is it, and how, I won't say is it, but how it's different from raising chickens. Um, well, as mentioned before, you don't need a lot of space or anything like that. Um, and it's nice. I, I like raising them, uh, as far as my brooder setup. Um, I can, I can get through a bunch of, a bunch of birds and, and have brooder space available, uh, since they're not in there for very long. Um, I can get them outside super fast. So, you know, I've got some chicks downstairs in my, in my, uh, brooder pens that, uh, Goodness, they're they're going to be in there for a few more weeks, and uh, in a few weeks, my quail are almost fully grown. <laughs> so, how how long does it how long do they need to be in a brooder before you move them up? Um, depends on the the temperature outside, uh, but generally they're off heat within a couple of weeks, um, and then you can move them outside. I usually keep mine off heat in the house for for another week or so. And once they get all their head feathers, I move them outside. So it's generally about four to five weeks. You can you can put them outside unless it's the dead of winter. Yeah, they don't need as much feed. Um, they do need a higher protein level feed than chickens do, uh, especially when they're growing. You want to have them on a twenty-eight or thirty percent game bird feed. Mm -hmm. uh, as, you know, as they're growing, since they do grow so fast, they're gonna they're gonna require uh, a little bit more nutrition. Um, I supplement mine with the, the Pertrell's, uh, poultry show and, uh, breeder supplement. Mm. Um, and, uh, that gives them, gives them, you know, some added amino acids and vitamins. Um, and then after that, uh, you can actually feed them a layer crumble, a, a chicken layer crumble. If you want a little bit larger sized eggs, you can you can add in some um, you know additional protein, um, you know some some more of that game bird starter or like a, a, a flock raiser or something just to boost the protein levels up a little bit, and that'll give you a, a, a little bit larger egg. I know with bob white quail, you you needed to use a special. Uh, water fount top that was very narrow to keep them from from grinding. Are Kerturnix prone to that as well? Absolutely. As as a baby chick, um, it's very easy for them to to fall into a chicken sized water. <laughs> With this setup here, um, I've got a, a small little uh, quail sized water there that they can't get into and get wet or drowned. Um, and then I also leave their, their food on a tray when they first hatch. So it's easier for them to find it. Mm. That's a good point. And that's just a regular gallonized wash tub, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. It didn't need anything fancy. You could use a, a, a tub like that, or you could use a, a plastic tote or, or something. I like to start them out in something pretty small. Uh, so it's easy for them to find their food and water. And uh, after a few days, they're already a pretty good size. And I can move them either to um, like a, a stock tank uh, with mm -hmm. some heat plates or um, I've got a, a GQF um, brooder setup that I can use. Uh, cool. And that's pretty handy. The one thing that I, I really struggled with, especially with white birds, which I never seem to get right, was how do you sex them? I, I know that the standard pharaoh or, or what I would call wild type, which is probably not correct, sorry, uh, you can sex them by color because there's a difference in the color of the breast of the females and the males. But I, I would be lost on some of these new solid colors. You know, I wouldn't know where to start. So this is the pharaoh that you were talking about. It is also called wild type, so you were absolutely correct. Oh, uh, you can see the male on top has a solid breast without those speckles that the female has. Mm -hmm. So in this picture here, you can see uh, the male on top uh, has a has a solid breast that's uh, reddish in color and lacks the speckles so that that female has. Um, he also has a, a chin strap, a white and black chin chin strap that is uh, easier to pick out than on that female there. So you can tell those apart pretty easy. And Rip, you are absolutely right. These are Pharaoh. 
um, uh, they're also called wild type. So I actually have a little video here to answer your question about how to sex them if they aren't feather sexable like that pharaoh is. Um, there, there are there are a few different color varieties that you can sex based on their their color and pattern, mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, Otherwise, you have to vent sex them. So you wait till they're sexually mature, and then you can actually uh, flip them over and look at their vent and be able to tell very easily, uh, as you can see in this video here. Okay, today we're going to talk about how to vent sex a Catortex quail. And so this one is a boy. And I'm going to flip him over, and he's going to struggle for a second. So if you look mm -hmm. at a boy, look at their vent. They've got a uh, bulbous area, this area right here. And you can even see it from the side. Not a lot of feathers and it's really poofy. Um, if you look at it, the vent opening is fairly small. It's not as big as you will see in a second on a hen. And the way you can really tell, tell a male from a adult female is if you squeeze it, you're gonna get foam, okay? So uh, that is how you can tell a male let me grab a female. So, this little girly here, her vent is much wider, fleshier. It's bigger to allow that egg to pass through. And you'll see it's, it almost looks bruised to looking around here. It's kind of a bluish purple color. And uh, very obviously there is no foam up here. There's no bulbous area just a uh, wide fleshy area for the egg. And that is how you vent sex a Caternix quail. The, I, you know, I wish I had known that 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Would have made it easier than waiting for them. Oh, to yeah. late. Okay, we've, we've talked about hatching quail, we've talked about brooding quail, and these little rascals grow so fast. We, we need to talk about adult housing at this point because because we're going to have all these birds that are starting to lay and you know you actually have a lot of different options rip um i i because of the way my business runs and and i sell hatching eggs i use a battery style setup um so these have rollout trays so uh the eggs stay nice and clean i can keep the birds separate by um their color and pattern and, uh, you know, super easy to be able to clean the cages with um, some, you know, trays to, to be able to remove the manure. Um, you can also keep them in a, kind of a rabbit hutch style cage. Um, you just want to make sure that with whatever cage you select, uh, that it's no more than 12 inches, 10 inches high, uh, you know, eight to 10 inches high is, is best. For exactly that reason what we talked about earlier, um, when, when, a, when a quail flushes and flies straight up in the air, if, if it's only eight to 10 inches high, they can't, they don't have enough room to get up a lot of speed uh, and, and really hurt themselves. So we like to, uh, to, to keep it nice and short or really tall. Um, you know, I've, I've kept my birds in uh, an aviary style setting on the ground um, and as long as your, your roof is uh, six feet high or more, um, or, you know, made of a material that they can kind of bounce off of, <laughs> like the wire and tarps here, uh, then, then you're okay. Um, and so I use this aviary type setting for a, a grow out pen. Um, I really like that setup. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. Um, I can grow these birds out, uh, you know, for, for myself. I've got some of my breeders tagged, um, and I can sit on a bucket and watch them run around and be able to select breeders um, or, you know, grow them out for somebody else. Um, I will say in this kind of setting, it's a little harder to find the eggs if you're raising them for eggs. I can see where <laughs> <Yeah>. it would be. <laughs> But I have heard that if you use a black light, the eggs glow pink if you look for them in the dark. So either that or you can keep your kids busy for a while looking for eggs. <laughs> Year-round Easter egg hunt. I love it. Exactly. Exactly. How, how big is that cage there? The aviary? That is a 10 by 20. And so, how many birds can you keep in the 
Um, I usually keep about 200 at a time in, in there. Um, now, those are, I, I can keep a little bit more birds in there at a time because those birds are sold um, before they reach full, you know, maturity and, and mm -hmm. you know, would start fighting with each other or anything like that. So um, if I were to keep them in there permanently, I'd want to provide some places for them to hide. Quail-like quail uh, things like overturned pots to be able to hide in or, you know, you can make little uh you know, houses and stuff. They, they like little places for them to, to, to go in and, and, you know, get away from other birds a little bit. Um, so, you know, if, if you were going to keep them in that permanently, uh, you could provide some of those things for them. What about shelter from weather conditions? What, what do they need? Mm -hmm. Particu particularly wind and rain and cold weather. That, that is exactly it. They just, they need shelter from wind and rain um, and, uh, as long as you have that, you don't have to provide supplemental heating unless you're, you're really in a, in a cold, cold area here in Tennessee. Um, we, we get down to, to freezing sometimes, uh, you know, a little below freezing. Um, and I, I don't supplement my birds with anything, uh, as long as they're fully grown. I just wait, for, wait for them to be fully grown before I put them outside. But other than that, protect them. They're like a chicken, protect them from wind and rain and you're good. When we talk about breeding, I, I know for best egg production, chickens need supplemental light. What about quail? Absolutely. They... Yeah, that is um, one thing about quail. They need about 14 hours of light a day to produce eggs. Um, so if you want them to produce during the winter, you're definitely going to need supplemental light and you don't need much. Um, some people just use some Christmas lights. They get some white Christmas lights and hang them on the cage. And, and that, that is enough to, to get them to produce through the winter. And a question I know is probably on a lot of our viewers' minds. Can I keep quail with my chickens? Can you, can you mingle them together? <sighs> the answer is it depends. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it first, it depends on your chickens. I have four breeder pens. And three out of four of those pens can house quail with my chickens. That fourth pen, the, those chickens, uh, they, they're going to pick on those quail and, and you know, and kill them. Um, but the other ones are, are pretty docile birds that wouldn't mind at all. I'm, I'm sure you could probably keep them with silkies, no problem. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you've got some more aggressive chickens, it might be a little harder. Um, the other thing to think about is being much smaller, quail can fall prey to predators that wouldn't necessarily hurt a chicken. Uh, so you, you really have to look at is your, if you're wanting to keep them together, is your chicken coop secure against rats and snakes? So you've probably already got it secure against, you know, raccoons and foxes, um, but you really want to use hardware cloth. Um, and maybe some tin, um, something like that to, to keep your, your quail safe from those other predators. Going back to your aviary, I noticed you had the tin around the bottom and I'm assuming mm -hmm. that's like two, two foot tin. Yes. Yeah. I actually have, uh, a, a hardware cloth skirt around that aviary. Uh, so if a predator starts to dig, they're going to hit the hardware cloth on the outside. Um, and I used four foot hardware cloth and ran two feet on the outside on the ground and two feet up the side of that aviary. Uh, and then I used that tin around it as well. And that tin one, it, it, it's, it helps predator proof it, um, just one added layer, but it also, I, for me, I feel like if predators can't see the birds, they're less likely to try to get in there. Um, and if, if a fox were to, to run by, it's not going to startle those birds and get them flying mm. and really get that fox interested. <laughs> so, so I that does it. help. I don't, I don't know that, you know, you would have to have it for, for the quail. It's just an added layer of protection for my peace of mind. And that can mean a lot sometimes. Gosh, we've covered a lot of ground, but I, I know that the folks viewing will probably have some questions and, and if you do, please. Uh, message us or, or make a comment when, when we post this video. Let us know what your question is, and we will see if we can't get Rebecca back 
to really get into detail, I, you know, personally, I want to learn more about the different colors. You know, Rebecca, I, I appreciate you uh, sharing with us. We, we covered some great, you make great, great points about quail. And folks, if you want to learn more about poultry nutrition, I would encourage you to watch this next video. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.